name is Erika uh, Melek Delgad. I am a postdoc fellow, a uh, Lady Hume fellow here at King's College London in UK. And I have been here for now two years. I got this grant of three years research for write a book about liberated African children in Sierra Leone, Cuba and Brazil. It's like a, a narrative of their lives and a comparative um, a study on childhood, on African childhood in, in Brazil, in Cuba and in Sierra Leone. So uh, for, for, for develop this project, I have been working on the creation of a database called um, uh, Historical African Childhood. And this is a database in reality. It's a brand, uh, it's a branch from uh, the database that I have been directing for a longer time that's called Freedom Narratives. So Freedom Narratives, it's the, it's the work that came from my previous postdoc that I did with Professor Paul Lovejoy at York University, Canada. Lovejoy and I, uh, in 2008, uh, developed this methodology to create this project called Freedom Narratives. That is a project that he had in his mind for quite a while. And um, in 2008, we had funding coming from Michigan State University from a project called Enslaved that they funded like seven different projects to help them to think about their methodology for this big digitally managed project they were creating. So for the narrative was, was born before that, but had kind of the body started to exist during that time where we could meet with other people thinking digitally managed projects and create how we could navigate uh, information on people's life uh, based on the on the on the database in a, in a digital format, we had database created by historians before thinking data such as um, vessels um, content that we are talking about people, but they took they treated more about like numbers. We had database as well related to uh, plantations. And then we need to remember all the time when you talk about those, those databases, we're talking about people, but they are always treated as content. So what Freedom Narrative thought that we literally lead to lead a way to think that data in a different way. So we will be talking about data, but we are talking mostly about people. So for Freedom Narratives, when we launched the first version uh, on this, on on the end of 2018, we had the support of, of Michigan State University uh, on the way that we could think that our idea to, of, 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 of having a database that was the, the core of the database, the heart of the database was the events of people's life was possible. So we, we proved that concept, we thought like, great, we could do it. But like, we felt that we needed a little bit more kind of a different technology to develop it. So we finish our our partnership with Michigan State University. They are part of our history, Very, we really appreciate that. But we started to work direct with like a person that could develop different narratives the way that we wanted. So we started to work with Kartike Shanda, that he, he is uh, at the moment a postdoctor um, candidate at the McGill University in Canada. And Kartike, how uh, with Kartike's uh, knowledge and our methodology, we were able to create first of all a portal where we could enter the data because previously the data was entered like in the Excel sheets <laughs> and sent it to, to 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 Michigan to enter the data like in a, in our website. So now our our, our format of entering data is completely different. We have like an intelligent portal where where it was created based in the way that we wanted to look at that data. So for freedom narratives, the person is the is the most important like um, element, but it's just not the person's in itself, but it's the person's life. And when we talk about life, we talk about the events that this person lived. So. As for the narrative, it's not a database on names. We are not we are not able to enter everybody we know that existed. So if I knew that someone existed and the name was John, 
I can't enter through the, him, this person through the narratives because I need to know a little bit more about John. So uh, for further narratives, our basic idea is that this person needs to have five events. So we can see some movement in their lives to be able to really talk about this person. And these five events, sometimes people think like, oh, this is too much, you know, like, especially because I don't know if I made this clear, but for the narrative is about people that were enslaved. So there was so so we our we are interested in to talk about people that were enslaved from from the era we call the transatlantic slave trade. So for, so from the sixth so the fifteenth seventeenth century to the end of the nineteenth century. And uh, and uh, and a lot of people think that we don't have enough information from that, but. What the narratives brings is like you need to have a specific methodology to work with the data. So for some people, we have amazing information written because they wrote their own biography, like Eduardo Quiano, or we have um, uh, information wrote on 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 journals, or that that brings a little bit more detail. But when we talk about the 12.5 million of people that were enslaved and traded from, from Africa to Americas, we know that we don't want to have an autobiography from the 12.5 million. So we needed to open our eyes to different kinds of sources. So what we re realized that if we make the correct questions to the sources, a lot of information can be extracted from. So for further narratives, we had these five events, as I said. So they can be the day that uh, like the year that the person was born if you have like a, an average idea when they were born you can have um the when they were enslaved because we're talking about an enslaved person you're sure that they were enslaved you if this person was a west african person and they end up for instance in bahia in brazil we know that this person embarked in a vessel and disembarked from a vessel and if this person is enslaved person in brazil we know this person was sold so you have read five events so that five events, it's easier to be able to grasp if you make the correct questions. Maybe you don't have the exact information. Well, maybe we don't know that this person was born the 25th of June of 1875. Yeah, maybe you don't know that information. But I don't think that it's enough to blank this person from, from the knowledge of the world that this person existed. At the same time, we cannot... Um, be so um keen to just have like details and uh, and we're just going to record everybody that have every every information from or not too broad that i'm going to record information of every person i heard that it was a name about it so it's when we are sure that this person really exists in a way so this is like the basic methodology to answer through the narratives data and uh, when we was able to do that we thought okay now we need to move on so with current K, we started to think about formats to bring this data in la alive. So because again, we are talking about the database, this data sometimes can be treated a lot as a number. And uh, this is where we want to move from. Uh, until now, uh, very good research has been done and it's extremely necessary to try to quantify the number of people that were trade and and they became enslaved and it was moved from a part of the world to another part those those projects is incredibly important but we see still that if you still deal with these people it's just number we are again treated them as a commodity and it's what we are trying to move from so when are we able to to organize the events of this person's life we also wanted to be able to inform exactly areas, geographic areas where that event happened. So uh, on the same time we are discussing about uh, events, we are trying to uh, organize at the same time information about geographic areas in Africa that for historian has been for a long time trying to find out information from. On the same time, we are discussing one thing that in further narratives we call uh, ethnonym slash language, that it's what is what this person how this person was identified was this person identified as a Hausa person was this person identified as a Timuni person and uh, we don't say that this is an ethnonym because we, we the data most of the data we are working with is data that was collected by a third person so for instance i'm brazilian but 
if you get a data from me and I say like a data I'm speaking in English, you can maybe in the future think that Erika Melek Dogad was a British person because she was in London and she spoke in English. But that is not true. English is one of the languages that I speak. So the same is for the people that were enslaved at that time. If you someone if you ask someone in English how it's a name, the person if they're in UK they go respond to you in English. And if you are in Brazil and you ask someone in Yoruba uh, their name, and if this person can speak Yoruba, they're going to respond in Yoruba the, what is the name. This means that this person is from New, is from the Yoruba land, or this means this person can speak Yoruba. So we need to remember that we're talking about people that had they were multilingual. So that 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 specific information on language and ethnicity needs to come together because we are unable really sometimes to, to say if the person spoke Yoruba or if the person was a Yoruba person. So this is a very important data that we are collecting with preliminary. It, it's beautiful to say that we, can, we are able to reconstruct people's life looking documents, but you have gaps. So those gaps, most of the time, methodologically, are, uh, are filled by historian works. So, for instance, if, I'm in, if I have a document telling me one specific information and the, the person, the next information that I know is this person is another place. And uh, I know I know a historian that came and studied a lot of the context of what was going on, the problem that the person is studying and entering the data was involved with. So what I do to connect that to information, it's going to do to the historian work and entering kind of this extra event. So for instance, if I know that someone is called John, but I'm sure this person was not born as John, there's cases we have the person was born as a Samba and becomes John. I don't have the, the event of baptism there, but I know this person was, for instance, I don't know, not John, João. So this person was in a, in a Portuguese vessel. There is a lot of historians telling me that the Portuguese baptized the, the people, the enslaved people before they were on board. So what I can do is add the event baptism. And uh, despite I don't have the information of it in the source, I have a, hist a whole historiography supporting my argument. And uh, I, so I entered the data, the, that event of baptism. And uh, when I entered that, that, that event, I, I say that, it's, that is imputed data. So everything that we don't take direct from the source, that is a conclusion of a historian, or if it's my conclusion as a researcher, private researcher, or is a conclusion for someone else or another historian that I'm using based, we use it as imputed data and we make clear for the, for the users and we entered the, the, the bibliography for where we took that information from. So for the narrative has kind of different ways to deal with these gaps, you know? So if, it, if, it, the, if the conclusion is my conclusion, if the conclusion is someone else's conclusion, but of course an academic that has power to talk about that, uh, has knowledge, sorry, to talk about th that information. Uh, and these goes because we don't wanna just to be a, a, a website where we extract information from a source. What we have is literally an area to, to publish research. So when you're creating a research, when you're writing an article, when you're writing a book, you have a lot of these imputes of information you get from colleagues, things you read, all the information that all the source brings to you. So this is the same way it happens in free the narratives. So the methodology of research is the same, but the difference is like we make very clear when you when you record each event for the for the for the users if that event is coming from a source directly or if it's coming from someone else. So the, so what for the narratives is in reality it's a place that uh, the data analysis that the, the, the a lot of data you collect from your research that historians has been doing can be published. So, so I am for Freedom Narratives, I am the director, but I'm also a collaborator. So my data is being entered in Freedom Narratives and then being presented in a, in, a, in a format. This doesn't say that I don't have another project, the data is going to be also in the other project because each of the project has a different goal and the data can be presented in different ways. So 
And uh, one thing that I saw is very interesting to say to finish that like we wanted this to be a strong database for academics to do research. So we, we follow like very high standards or how to organize data. We entered when we are able to um, the image of the sources we are getting the information from for two reasons. One is to prove that uh, the data we are entering is real. And that the other reason is to make available sources that maybe sometimes people will not be able to assess. I wanted to make very clear, we are not an archive, we are not uh, an online archive, so we follow the rules, but we don't expect to have the same standard as an archive. And all the time we, we are able to, we direct this person to, to where the information is. We want the, in reality to communicate with other like digital humanities collaborations. So if you are able to, to look at the full source in like the British Library website, you're going to see the British Library website. We at the moment as well creating, because we work a lot with freedom, narr with freedom narratives with um, Sierra Leone Public Archive, we are creating uh, the, their own uh, website because uh, unfortunately the archive doesn't have the website in like soon. We will be able to, when you see through the narratives and see that we have a, like a document that it's in, that we are being used, we can direct you to look at to Sierra Leone online archive and, and have a, a touch with that. So through the narratives at the same time, it's, it's, it's moving to very different areas. So we are not just communicate with other kind of project that spoke directly with um, the same data because we wanted to so, for instance, that is a, a very um, a well structured project called the Voyage, uh, Slave Voyage, that where you have a lot of information people's, uh, uh, um, on, on the previous trajectory inside, inside of the slave uh, vessel. So, when I'm talking about someone's life, and uh, if I can tell that this person was inside of this vessel, what we do through the narrative, we enter that information, and you can click and go to be transported to, to the other website. So this is a way to communicate with our website's data. So if you take information from another website, we, we try to interlink them. But we also do that on the source area. So all the information we, we, ha we entered, we entered a source. So the source is also linked to where the source, where the source came. And, uh, and uh, we also try to talk to, 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 to projects as well in a different way. So for instance, with, Sierra Leone uh, Public Archive, we are communicate with them as 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 different institutions, you know, to give the support we can give uh, on that side.